If you're building a World War I replica and can't use an original engine, it can be really hard to find an alternative. World War I engines were really unique, and there aren't any modern engines that work well as direct substitutes. This makes engine selection the big question that hangs over most World War I replica projects, and it's usually the part of the plane that requires the most creativity. I'm going to be starting my engine build soon, and this video is going to be an explanation of what my plan is. Um, I will continue to work on the fuselage. Um, during an engine build, most of the time is spent looking for parts and waiting on machine shops, so I should have plenty of time left over to continue working on the fuselage as well. The SE-5A was fitted with a lot of different engines, but they were basically all just variations on the Hispano Suiza V8. The Hispano Suiza was one of, if not the greatest engine of the war. It was mostly constructed of aluminum, it had single overhead cams and a dry sump oiling system, and its power to weight ratio was phenomenal for the day. Even by today's standards, it was pretty good. The first few SE-5As were fitted with a 150 horsepower direct drive Hispano Suiza, but they quickly switched to a 200 horsepower engine that was geared down to swing a really big four-bladed prop. This was probably the worst version of the SC-5A, because those geared engines were prone to the gears breaking. The best version of the SC-5A was the one that was fitted with the 200 horsepower Wolseley Viper. The Wolseley Viper is basically just a Hispano Suiza with higher compression. These engines made 200 horsepower at 2000 RPM. Planes of the era had really big propellers. The Wolseley Viper equipped SE-5A had a propeller that was 7 feet 10.5 inches, which is absolutely huge! This is the root of the reason why it's so hard to find modern substitutes for original engines. The bigger a propeller diameter gets, the faster the propeller tip speed gets for a given RPM. This is because as the propeller gets longer, the more distance the propeller tip has to travel for each degree that the crankshaft turns. This is a problem because propeller tips really shouldn't exceed 75% the speed of sound. If they go any faster than that, they lose a lot of their efficiency. And so this basically means that the bigger the, your propeller gets, the slower your engine has to turn. If I use a 7 foot 10.5 inch original prop, it can only turn 2000 RPM before the tips exceed 75% the speed of sound. Horsepower is a measure of both how hard you twist a crankshaft and how quickly you do it. So if you want to generate a relatively large amount of power while spinning the crankshaft relatively slowly, you need to twist that crankshaft really hard. Horsepower is torque times RPM divided by 5250, so we can use this to calculate how much torque we need. Um, so to generate 200 horsepower at 2000 RPM, we need 525 pound-feet, which is a lot of torque. There really aren't any modern engines that are like this. Most automotive engines make their peak horsepower between 4000 and 6000 RPM, and while aircraft engines are a lot closer to what I'm looking for, they typically have peak horsepower as about 400 to 500 RPM too high. For example, an 0540 is close to what I need, it makes the right amount of power, but it peaks at 2400 RPM. To illustrate how different the Hispano Suiza was, um, here's a graph of the horsepower and torque for a relatively stock uh, 350 horsepower Pontiac 400, and here's a pretty closely approximated one for the Hispano Suiza. My plan is to take an automotive engine and modify it to make it act like a Hispano Suiza. So there's basically two things that I need to do here. I need to raise the torque peak up to 525 pound-feet to match the Hispano Suizas, and then I need to move that torque peak down to 2000 RPM. One solution that a lot of people use is a prop speed reduction unit, or a PSRU. This is basically just a set of gears or pulleys that exchanges RPM for torque. I'd rather not use one of these for a couple of reasons. For one, they're usually pretty heavy, they can weigh up to 100 pounds. They're also pretty expensive because they usually have to be custom made, so I'd much rather use direct drive. Most relatively mild uh, 10 to 1 compression street engines make about 1.1 pound-feet of torque per cubic inch of displacement. To be conservative, let's assume that I can only make 1 pound-foot per cubic inch. This means that to make 525 pound-feet, I'll need 525 cubic inches. 
Moving torque up and down the rev range is mostly done with cam selection, valve size, and port size. So basically this means that I need to find some heads with small valves and small ports to be well suited to that low amount of power and I need to find a cam grinder who can design a cam that's well suited to peaking at that RPM. The engine that I've chosen to do this with is the Pontiac 400 and I have a couple reasons for this. One, they're very lightweight when compared to other engines of the same displacement. A big block Chevy would be about 100 pounds heavier than a Pontiac 400. And this gets even better because during the gas crisis, they lighten the blocks even more. A gas crisis era block only weighs about 185 pounds. These gas crisis blocks have 557 stamped in the last part of the serial number, and because they can't take as much power, they're relatively undesirable and easy to find. The geared Hispano Sueza weighed 500 pounds, and the direct drive version weighed 450. So as long as I can be in that range and not exceed it, I'm doing pretty good for weight. So I put together a list of all of the components that I think I'm going to use, and I got a final total weight of 430 pounds. Now, in the real world, it's probably going to be a little bit heavier, but I think this is a pretty good margin of error, and I'm pretty certain I can make it under 500 pounds. The second good thing about Pontiac V8s is they accept some really large crankshafts. The biggest one I could find was 4.75 inches, which is absolutely massive for a crankshaft. Now, when you increase the stroke of a crankshaft, you increase the displacement of an engine, so putting that crankshaft in a Pontiac 400 with a 60 thousandths overbore would increase the displacement to 528 cubic inches, which is almost exactly what I'm looking for to make the amount of torque that I need. The best thing about Pontiac V8s is they had a huge variety of displacements. When the engine family started in 1955, they had a displacement of 287 cubic inches, and they grew all the way up to 455 cubic inches, and most parts interchange between those engines. The great thing is, in 1955, the 287 made 200 horsepower, which is perfectly suited for me. That means that the ports and the valves are almost exactly the right size, and you can bolt those on to an extremely high displacement engine. There's very few engine families out there that allow that. Uh, you can't find big block Chevy heads that small. So to summarize, it should be possible to take a Pontiac 400 and modify it to act like a Hispano Suiza, which is exactly what I'm looking for. Safety is definitely a huge concern, and it's one that I haven't addressed yet. There's a lot of huge differences between aircraft engines and car engines, and there's a lot of safety features that aircraft engines have that car engines don't. So, in order to be safe, I have to add those features. A big one is using magnetos. In a car, the ignition is provided by a distributor, which gets its power from the car's battery. This means that if you have an electrical failure, your car stops running. This is a much bigger problem in an aircraft, so planes use what's called a magneto, which generates its own power and is independent of the battery. There are magnetos made for Pontiac V8s. They're typically used in drag racing and uh, high power applications because they generate a hotter spark. So I plan to use a magneto from Vertex or Mallory. Planes also have what's called dual ignition, where they run two magnetos instead of one, so that if one of them fails, you still have an engine running. My plan for doing this is to take an old distributor and cut out the distributor lobe and replace it with a distributor drive gear. I would then mount two magnetos in the side of the distributor so that I could run two instead of one. This would definitely be challenging, but I'm confident I could make it. The only issue here is that I would only have one spark plug per cylinder, so what I would do is run two plug wires to each spark plug. This isn't unprecedented. Most Corvair engine conversions that have dual ignition do this. The carburetor is also a safety concern, because if you tilt a carburetor at too steep an angle, you can get float bowl slosh and flooding. I plan to use the Autolite 2100 carburetor, which has a good reputation among the off-roading community. They drive at some pretty extreme angles, so I'm fairly confident it would perform well. Another thing that I would like to do is add a fifth main bearing. Most car engines have relatively thin main bearings when compared to airplane engines, and that's because a propeller puts a ton of stress on the crankshaft. 
Most good safe auto engine conversions add a fifth main bearing up by the prop shaft to help support things. I would like to copy the one that Steve Whitman built for his Oldsmobile powered tailwind. What he did is really ingeniously simple. He just mounted a big sealed main bearing up on an aluminum bell housing. I'm really excited about getting to work on the engine, and I'm hoping to be able to dyno it in December, although that may be a bit over optimistic. Thank you for watching!